I'd like to thank everybody for, for joining us. And, and uh, it's very exciting to find out what's happening in Iceland. And, and we have uh, uh, Scott Glenn, who's our director of the Hawaii State Energy Office. So thank you, Scott, for, for joining us. And, and uh, Dr. Martin Voigt from Iceland. So Martin, uh, thank you. Thank you for coming all this way. And uh, I'd like to thank all of you from across the state uh, from, for joining us. And I'm gonna just pass this right on to you, Stan. Why don't you begin? All right. Well, thanks to, to Scott Glenn for um, helping sponsor today's event and also for HPU's participation and letting us borrow Steve Allen for a few minutes and uh, Oscar to help us put this thing together. And thanks everybody. I'd like to just, I don't wanna take up a bunch of time, but. I'd like to say that Iceland is a really interesting place with a lot of um, a lot in common with Hawaii, but also a real big contrast to Hawaii in many ways. But um, the it's the things that are alike in Hawaii and Green in Iceland that I think bring us together today. And one of them is geothermal, and the other one is innovation and cooperation as a community to do what's good for your your environment. So. Uh, I think with the guests that we have lined up, you'll you'll learn a lot today. I certainly learned a lot just talking to some of the folks we have coming on today. So as Michael mentioned, we've got Scott Glenn, the Chief of the Energy Office for the State of Hawaii. We have Dr. Martin Voigt, uh, geochemist in um, CarbFix, uh, is the company he works with in Iceland. We have um, Eugene Tian, who's the state economist, works out of the uh, Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism and taught me everything I know about economics. Um, Keone Ford, the president of um, Dibs Hawaii, I would say he's kind of an, a networking entrepreneur. He's got a lot of, a lot of things going in his, um, in his background, but I think one of the things that we'll appreciate a lot uh, that he contributes here is he's getting a bunch of diverse folks together to cooperate and, and come up with solutions that work for everybody. Um, Scotty Wong, if you looked at, the, um, at his picture, in the, in the setup. Um, my big favorite thing there is he's got some really good looking produce and makes me wonder why we ship so much stuff in from the mainland um, instead of just buying it here locally. And then Dr. Stephen Allen, who's a, a professor at HPU and um, has a big uh, environmental slash um, sci environmental science background. So he's, it, you know, truth and lending, we borrowed him too from HPU for a couple hours a, a week to help set this up. So thanks for your participation there. He's going to do a presentation as well. So to start things off, we've got um, Scott Glenn from the, the head of the state energy office, and he's going to talk about his recent visit up to Iceland and what he learned up there. And also just a little bit about what's going on here in Hawaii. So Scott, take it away. Thank you, Stan. Um, aloha, everyone. And thank you for having me here today. Um, I'd like to really thank Renew Rebuild Hawaii for putting this together and putting this important topic in the mix of our energy and climate policy discussions here in Hawaii. Um, also, my, uh, my Zoom profile picture was a call out for you, Martin. We haven't had the chance to meet, um, but I did get to visit the Carp Fix facility and really enjoyed it. Um, so wanted to share a little bit about this experience and how the energy office and the state is thinking about these topics. Um, in many ways, Hawaii is a, is a leader on renewable energy. I don't have to rehash that with you guys. Although I do want to note, um, recently we've, we've realized that since Governor Ige became governor in 2014 to today, we have doubled the amount of renewable energy in Hawaii from 20% to 40% over about eight years. And we have effectively hit our 2030 goal already, eight years ahead of schedule based on the renewable portfolio standard. So we're making some great progress um, and some of our islands are further along than others. Hawaii Island, I think is at about 60% now um, and Kauai Island is almost at 70%, um, which is our 2040 goal. Um, and they're also some days of the week, 100% renewable energy for electricity. So we're making some really great progress, um, but we're also realizing, and I think Eugene will get into this too, that while we're doing great on the electricity side, the transportation side is still a big challenge. And on top of that, we as a state are the only state in the United States that has a net negative emissions goal, which is to say we have a goal to sequester more than we emit within the state. 
And we've been investigating the different ways of how we're going to achieve that. And so one of the ways that caught our eye recently was Iceland. And what Iceland's doing, it's very innovative. And we also, as an island, like to look to other islands to figure out island solutions. And as Governor Ige likes to say, here in Hawaii, we are thousands of miles away from the nearest help. And so we have to figure out ways to do things ourselves as islands because we think that's the only solutions that scale to the planet because Earth itself is an island and we can't reach out to other places for help to deal with our climate, self-inflicted climate change problems. So we are, we are very keen to um, better understand the Iceland situation and how they're approaching, um, especially their electricity and transportation and emissions goals and issues. So uh, Governor Ige and I were already planning to attend COP26 in Glasgow last year. And so since we were already going to be in that part of the world, um, I asked Governor, hey, do you mind if I go over to Iceland since we're already here and uh, take a look and see how things are going over there? He said, of course, I'd love to come with you. And then, of course, everybody in Hawaii said, you can't be away for th three weeks from, from Hawaii. So he was only able to come over for about eight days for Scotland, which, by the way, was his first international trip since COVID started, was to go to COP26. And I'll get... And, you know, one of the reasons I think for him that it was so important to go is because President Biden had recommitted the United States to the Paris Agreement and Governor Ige wanted to go to reinforce that commitment at the state level and show that we are all in together and that the federal and state governments were working together now, but also should the federal government do another 180 that Hawaii is still committed nonetheless to climate action because we've committed ourselves by statute to mitigate and adapt in a way that's consistent with our pro rata share of emissions of the United States emissions under the Paris Agreement. So we went to, to the COP to give that message. And following the COP, um, I arranged to go to Iceland and to visit several of the power facilities there and meet with several of the government, business, and community leaders in Iceland. And I want to give a special shout out to the University of Hawaii um, especially Colin Lee, who I think might be on this call um, at this forum, and to Professor Chip Fletcher, because they not only came with me on this trip to help provide a scientific um, analysis and perspective, they also did all the heavy lifting on the logistics of the trip. So you know how important that can be. So they really they really made this trip happen. And so I want to thank them for that. Um, when we when we got to Iceland, there were some really surprising um, commonalities. And Stan, you mentioned that at the beginning, we do have some things in common with Iceland, not just being an island, but we're also struggling with the effects of tourism and the scale of tourism relative to the population, relative to the economy, and how we handle that, how we digest it, how we balance tourism, environmental stewardship. Um, Iceland also has some big challenges on supply chains, cost of living and the deployment of renewable energy. And in some ways, they're, they're learning some lessons from Hawaii in that they are now looking at deploying new forms of renewable energy that are starting to get community opposition. And so, you know, we've been down this road already for a while now, and we're really starting to pivot to do a better job of listening to community and integrating community into our renewable energy and our renewable energy into communities. And so Iceland, we had some good discussions with some of the policy leaders there about that. Um, to get into some of the kind of exciting work that's going on there, and Martin, I'll leave it to you to talk about the science and the detail and all the really great stuff that Carfix is doing. Um, but what we, what we looked at were one, um, some of the hydropower plants and what some of the companies are doing to look at what are called electrofuels and using some of their electricity to create um, hydrogen from water and pull CO2 from the air and combine renewable electricity and heat to create a hydrocarbon that's basically kerosene that they can use to make jet fuel. And this is some projects that are going on with Rotterdam and other places in Scandinavia and Northern Europe where they are looking at coming up with what, what we heard from Climeworks was this idea of defossilization on our way to decarbonization which is to say we're still going to need hydrocarbons for especially jet travel, um, but those hydrocarbons don't have to come from fossil fuel out of the ground. Those hydrocarbons could come from 
abundant resources around us applied with renewable electricity. And so that's some really cutting edge work. And I don't think it's too much of an exaggeration to say that Hawaii's economy is fundamentally a jet fuel economy. If you look at the two largest legs of our economy, tourism and defense, we fly 10 million tourists every year out of the state of Hawaii on jet fuel. And our Navy and Department of Defense rely on jet fuel for both their aircraft, aircraft and many of their Navy vessels. Their ships also run on a form of jet fuel. And so the two largest part of, parts of our economy depend on that. And so if we can start finding some renewable ways to create jet fuel, um, especially if it's not necessarily um, bio-based, bio, and let me say bio-based, I think will have an important role to play, um, especially in the near term for sustainable aviation fuels. Um, but if we have a longer term view of how we can create this jet fuel and, and merge it with more of our electricity goals, that's probably going to be more long-term sustainable for the state. Um, but I think that's still a policy discussion to have. So that was one thing we went to look at. And then the other is we went to look at the, I'm gonna say this the wrong way, so Martin, please correct me. The Headless, Headless Haiti uh, geothermal power plant. Was that close enough? Um, it's perfect. Yes. Uh, okay. I, pr I really practiced that. And it's, you know, it's kind of trying to show that same respect, right? Because we get tourists who come to Hawaii all the time and they give up trying to pronounce our place names. And so I really did try to not just give up on pronouncing Icelandic place names while I was there. Um, but uh, so, so this power plant, it's one of the world's largest geothermal power plants. It's about 300 megawatts, um, which is about 10 times the sign, size of ours. Headless CD power plant. All right, that's a nice mnemonic. Okay. Um, so, uh, and again, Martin can get into the details of it. What was really, um, what, was, what was really interesting to us was how, and we want to understand better this, the, both the physics and the policies that helped create this, this combination of this geothermal power plant, the geologic sequestration that CARP fix is doing, as well as the direct air capture plant that had just opened up last fall that Climeworks based in Switzerland was doing. And together, these three efforts really amount to a net negative power plant. And that's, that's a tremendous thing to be able to claim and to do that we have a geothermal power plant that, that has zeroed out its emissions um, through the work that Martin's doing. And then in turn is also powering direct air capture, pulling CO2 out of the air and burying it in the ground. And together, that's net negative. That's, that's something that we in Hawaii had not thought was really on the near-term horizon possible. And so to see it in action um, was amazing. And, and Two of Martin's colleagues were really generous with their time to give us a tour and talk to us. Um, one of them in particular, um, uh, Dr. Gretar Iversen, uh, which I don't know if I said his name right, but I'm trying. Um, he, uh, he, he greeted us at the entrance with aloha. And so we all said, oh, thanks. You know, just kind of thinking, oh, he knows we're from Hawaii. He said aloha. And then he told us that he got his PhD from the University of Hawaii at Manoa in volcanology. And so he not only knew aloha, he knew what our experience was. He understood the Hawaii context. And so he was really able to help relate some of the work that they're doing to the Hawaii context. And since then, we've been working with him, um, a colleague, Balder Brynjarsson, um, as well to see about how we can translate more of that technological expertise to Hawaii. So the Energy Office is working with the University of Hawaii and working with um, the CARP fix and the headless CD, headless CD folks. Um, I think I leaned too much into the English on that mnemonic. Um, and then also just um, one last interesting aspect on that was, um, we also had the chance to meet with Hildegunner Thorsteinsen um, she serves on the parent company's parent company's board of directors as the managing director for research and innovation. And she's the chairwoman of the board for On Power, which is the parent company to Carb Fix. And so she used to work with the Department of Energy, the US Department of Energy. So she's very familiar with the US and the Hawaii context as well. And so we were able to have some really positive discussions there. Interestingly, ultimately, energy companies in Iceland are publicly owned. They're not private corporations. 
And so that was another interesting distinction from the Hawaii context. Um, if you'd like, there's a report that um, the University of Hawaii, Colin Lee drafted up of, of this trip um, that's available publicly. And I don't know if Colin's here or Monique could share the link to it in the chat, um, but we'd, we'd certainly welcome folks to look at it. Um, I know I've been going for a little bit. The trip was really exciting um, just to connect it a little bit back home to Hawaii. Uh, in working with Governor Ige on our clean energy initiative and our climate goals, you know, he's been very keen to not only highlight that the world is on a race to zero for emissions, um, in order for us to basically keep the planet from heating up past 1.5 degrees, which will endanger islands like Hawaii and Iceland, we need to pursue negative emissions. And we're pursuing them through two, two main strategies. One is through natural and working lands which is the Department of Land and Natural Resources and the Office of Planning and Sustainable Development's Kuleana. So they're, they're the two really taking the lead on that. And governor committed 100 million trees to the global one trillion tree initiative as part of this carbon sequestration um, challenge that we need to confront. On the other side of the, of the sequestration conversation though are engineered or mechanical or geologic sequestration. And, in that, and for those subjects, um, governor has asked the Hawaii State Energy Office to take the lead on those, which is partly why we're also working with the university and doing these. Doing these. What's layered onto that, and I think what Keone will be talking about, and he really brought to my attention, was our real need for also a strategy on carbon utilization and storage, and that we do have uh, emissions in the state of Hawaii, and we also have an industrial need for CO2, and that we currently don't have enough industrial CO2, while we also have an abundance of CO2 that we're just putting straight into the air. And so I think we need to do some more thinking about that and how that fits into both our system today, as well as our transition to the future system, where Hawaii is a 100% clean, renewable, resilient economy. And I think part of the way that we think about getting to there is to draw on our environmental folks to think a little bit about the the way we think about environmental impacts and trash, right, is we want to avoid impacts first. We want to reduce the ones that we have to have, and then we want to reuse or recycle anything that we are putting out there. And so I think ultimately we're trying to avoid emissions and we're trying to switch to renewable energy and figure out what our industrial CO2 source will be in a renewable energy world. But on the way there, we have industrial CO2 emissions happening today. We have CO2 emissions happening from fossil fuel activity today. And so what are some of the strategies and tactics we can deploy today to capture and use those without extending or prolonging our fossil fuel reliance and recognizing that they're a part of our transition piece, uh, but also not the long-term solution for our industrial CO2 needs. So I think Keone will have a lot more to offer on that. Um, and, and then finally, I'd just like to say that um, you know, I think we're we're really excited about what this technology can offer. Um, I also just want to put a word of caution out that I think Hawaii has a has a real history with geothermal that we have to listen to, we have to pay attention to it, and we have to acknowledge um, in in some real ways the trauma that some of our communities have experienced around this technology, and so. I think that if we were just to say, let's do negative emissions and let's go with geothermal, it'd be a disservice to, I think, some of the some of the inward looking and healing that we need to do with some of our communities and people who have very strong feelings about the role of geothermal in Hawaii. And we want we want anything that we're going to do like this to be seen as a largely a benefit to the people of Hawaii. And so I would I would encourage folks as you think about the solutions and the ways that this gets integrated into our transition, that it's also done in a way that really is respectful to our people and gives them a voice in that transition. So Stan, thank you very much. And again, thank you everyone for making time to be here today. Well, Scott, thank you for your leadership in the State Energy Office. It's really a breath of fresh air. Um, I worked in DBED for six years. We like having you in there. Um, so you're doing a great job. A, a little exclamation point on something that Scott mentioned though, a lot of people, 
don't don't realize and i do from my military background when when he talked about the aviation fuel piece those airlines that come in from overseas or the mainland they don't come with return fuel on board they have to get their fuel here and that's why focusing like scott said on being able to do that bridge fuel even if it's carbon based but not fossil fuel based is is probably something that most people don't think about in addition it's not just the ships and and some of the air force airplanes that use um fuels aviation fuel but when the military buys fuels they don't buy 10 different kinds of fuels so even military tanks and other other vehicle generators they all run on the same fuel and that same fuel is aviation fuel so when scott mentions that that's an important link in how we have to adjust um hawaii's picture on on fossil fuels it, it's something that we really have to think about until the aviation world transitions to some other kind of fuel. Um, that's what the military, all the military and all our airlines are going to be depending on when they come here. And it has to be available here. And so if we have to ship the fuel in from the mainland, man, that's carbon going into the air right there. And we need to be able to do it efficiently and effectively here and cleanly. Um, so if you have questions, please feel free to put them in chat. We'll try and catch them in chat and and bring them up. But our next presenter is uh, Martin Voigt from Iceland. So it's almost time for him to go to bed, um, but we appreciate him sticking up, staying up late to talk to us. So Martin, it's uh, all yours. Thank you very much, um, Stan, and also uh, Scott for this very nice introduction <clears throat> to, uh, to you know, the topic in Iceland as well. Um, and good morning to everyone. It's very nice to talk here today and get a perspective from Hawaii on, you know, their similarities to Iceland and then introduce our technology from Caltex a little bit. It's very interesting to hear about all of these parallels, you know, with both of us being islands, basaltic islands, volcanic islands in the middle of the ocean. The climate is, of course, different, very different. You win in that respect. Um, the background picture you can see here is not right now, but in the winter it's cold. Right now it's maybe some 55 degree Fahrenheit, um, at least outside. But inside, that's the nice thing. Uh, I have it now at around 82, 83 Fahrenheit. And, and that's the special thing about Iceland. We, you know, we have this geothermal energy with very low emissions and it's very cheap. So we can pretty much in the winter, everyone has their windows open a little bit and still the radiator is heating on full blast, which is not a problem. So it's, it's, it's very interesting to kind of think about these special places, these uh, islands in the ocean. And in, uh, also in, in terms of, you know, your history and your experience with acceptance, public acceptance of energies like geothermal and activities like this. It's very interesting to hear about this. I think that there has been a recent survey here in Iceland about the acceptance of different types of energy, how happy the public is with those. Geothermal by far was the most accepted one here. Pretty much no one has a problem with that. Um, hydropower is a little bit more controversial here. Um, also for one reason that the, uh, the off-takers of this energy are mainly large industrial plants, aluminum plants, smelters and so on, and not the public that benefits from this. And, and very curiously, uh, there is almost no wind turbines here, even though it's a very windy place. And, and the acceptance of this was also by far the lowest of the renewables, which is mainly due to the people here don't want to kind of have the image of these wind turbines on the island. Because same as for you, uh, tourism is a very important industry here. So people are scared that wind turbines all over the country will harm this kind of uh, rough image of Iceland, of this wilderness. That being said, I will try to share my screen now and then I can give you a little bit of an introduction. Uh, I hope you can see my screen, uh, the presentation. Perfect. So I'm, I'm working for Carfix here in Iceland and what we have to offer is this, so to say, rock solid climate solution. And it's uh, very interesting to introduce this to you and, and see you know, how, tell to you how, how this is working, a little bit about the background of our company and the whole project, the whole technology, a little bit about the future, and then also you know, what we can do to help others, uh, like in Hawaii, to, uh, to get this going. So if I go to the next slide, the background, of course, we are all familiar with, I guess, um, climate change. And this plot here shows, this diagram shows the role of different 
solutions uh, to you know uh, avoiding billions of tons of CO2 until 2060. You can see here there's several solutions, including renewables, efficiency increases, fuel switching, nuclear, and all of those will play a role. Um, but you can see this green bar here is CCS, carbon capture and storage. And there's 115 gigatons here. That's a substantial amount of carbon um, that has to be avoided um, by 2060 using technologies of carbon capture and storage in most of the projections. So we cannot really get around this uh, just by, you know, using renewables, increasing uh, efficiency, fuel switching, and nuclear. We need some part of CCS, and CarbFix will be part of that solution. I'm not saying that CarbFix is the silver bullet here. It's not our claim that we will solve climate change. Not even that we will be 100% of CCS globally. We will be a part of the solution. We will still have to use renewables. We still have to increase efficiency, fuel switching, nuclear, all of these things have to happen. And other technologies uh, of carbon capture and storage as well. But we have a kind of special solution that is um, safe, reliable, and cheap uh, in the right places. Uh, Iceland is kind of the lowest hanging fruit for us. This is where the project started and is currently operating. And I will show you later how this relates to where we can do it. But of course, Hawaii is a, is a kind of dream to implement this as well because of the similarities between the two islands. So as I said, these climate goals, they will not be met without carbon capture and storage. We cannot get around this. And this is the reason uh, why we focused on, the, uh, uh, on this. Uh, CarbFix itself is the expert for the storage part here. We also have carbon capture. In some places, I will show you later an example from yeah, the geothermal power plant where our operation is running. So there we do the carbon capturing as well. But in general, we can work together with other capture technologies. And earlier it was mentioned, we're working together, for example, with Climeworks, this Swiss company that are capturing CO2 directly from air. So it's a sort of plug and play solution that we can do the storage part and others can do the capture. So what we do at CarFix really is turning captured CO2 into stone underground in less than two years through a proprietary technology that imitates and accelerates natural processes. I will go in de into detail later on how this exactly works, what is behind this process that turns CO2 from gas into stone. But here on this picture, you can see an example of a drill core um, from the subsurface where you can actually see a natural rock that uh, is basaltic. Most of Iceland is basaltic in the underground and uh, these white spots you can see in this drill core are calcite. So that's a carbonate mineral, a mineral that took up carbon and CO2 and turned it into stone. Uh, in this case, that's a natural example. So this is a natural process that happens over billions of years. And what we do at CarbFix is kind of optimizing the conditions to speed this process up so that it's relevant for climate change over human timescales. But it's nothing fundamentally new. This process has been happening over the history of the Earth over the last millions of years, and um, and, and you know also the in, in theory this uh, reservoir of having CO two underground fixed in rocks is the biggest reservoir of CO two on Earth. Um, moving on um, to who we are at CarbFix, and it was mentioned earlier also by Scott that. You know, most of the geothermal companies, or at least part of them, are public. And uh, our mother company, uh, Okavita Reykjavik, Reykjavik Energy, is one of those. So Okavit, uh, this, this company, OR, you see there at the bottom, is owned by the city of Reykjavik and other munic municipalities here. And we are a subsidiary of this company. We have sister companies, OM Power. They are responsible for generating the electricity and also heat at the geothermal power plants. Uh, there's also a sister company uh, responsible for the fiber internet network and then a utilities company later distributing all of these, uh, the, the heat and the electricity. So this is kind of our status. Uh, and I will later show you a little bit of the history, why this happened and how this happened. Our flagship project at the moment is the CO2 capture and mineral storage at the Hattles Heady power plant that you can see on the right-hand side of this slide. 
<clears throat> I will show you a little bit more about this later, but this is kind of the biggest project that is ongoing now and has been ongoing since 2014, where we capture the CO2 from the geothermal gases actually that come up when you produce the geothermal uh, uh, steam and generate electricity from it. And we take this, capture it and uh, inject it into the underground again and turn it into rocks in a, in a very short time. So the history, um, the, we have a couple of years of history or more than a decade of history already, starting in around 2008. So this all came out of a collaboration between industry and academia, industry being Reykjavik Energy, this uh, geothermal power company here in Iceland. And they are very happy to provide drill holes and you know facilities to test this technology and make it work. And this is one of the unique parts of Iceland. It's a small island, but people are very innovative and happy to just, you know, without much uh, planning and licensing, just do it and try it, which is very nice. The hierarchies are very low. Uh, we have a lot of public pools here as well. It's cold outside. You sit in the hot geothermal water where you can meet maybe the president or the mayor of a city or something. Um, it's, it's very easy to get talking and get things like this going, which is probably one of the reasons why this happened in Iceland. So this was a collaboration between Reykjavik Energy, the University of Iceland, Columbia University, and also the CNRS in France. And this project started up uh, you know, between 2006, 7, 8. The first pilot injections then happened around 2009, 10. And since 2014, this is now applied on an industrial scale at this geothermal power plant in Hedlisheim. This was then, uh, published and confirmed in numerous scientific papers uh, based on various methods, many geochemical methods, where you look at you know, the fluids that travel in the underground, you sample them again in monitoring holes, uh, pump them up, and then you do mass balance calculations of how much of the CO2 stays in the underground and how much um, does not. And what was confirmed there is that 95% of the CO2 was mineralized within two years, which is incredible. No one really um, you know, expected this fast reaction um, but this is what happened and, you know, thinking it after this, you know, after doing it and modeling and so on, it all makes sense. In 2017, then we started this collaboration with Climeworks. So that's this a Swiss company doing direct air capture. So they have big machines capturing CO2 directly from the air. Of course, this is very energy intensive because the CO2 is not very concentrated in the air. So you need a lot of energy to concentrate it from air. Uh, they tested this with a single unit since 2017. This was scaled that up then in 2021. It started and Scott saw this uh, in Headless Haiti next to the power plant. Now they have a, a bigger plant there um, capturing nominally 4,000 tons a year. And this will be scaled up even further. So we're already working on the next bigger plant with them. Um, we have other projects, for example, you can see here the SOPA project is a very recent one where we capture the CO2 from, uh, from a waste facility here in Iceland from organic waste where methane is generated, but also CO2 as a byproduct and we capture this and inject it back into the underground. So there's various projects going on in, uh, in many directions and not all of them are listed here, just a couple of them. So this all went along and in the middle of that, around 2019-20, Carbfix was then founded as a subsidiary company of Orkavit and Reykjavik, of Reykjavik Energy. So this was formalized then, and uh, since then it's, it's you know uh, um, its own company, so to say, as a subsidiary. And the main thing we're working on now, as you can see here uh, in the future, is scaling this technology up. And, uh, and this is going in various directions. One of them is the storage hub. And of course, there's also a lot of research and development going on and in looking into other geology, you know, other rock types than basalt. Can we do this? Also other fluids. Can we use uh, salt water instead of fresh water? Things like this. Uh, so we're moving uh, in a lot of directions, but the, the main thing is, of course, to scale this up to make it relevant for climate. What we are you know, injecting at the moment is relevant on the local scale for the power plants and the communities here. This is, you know, for example, at the power plant, it's around 12,000 tons of CO2 a year. For Climeworks Orca, this plant is designed for 4,000 tons a year. But if we look at the gigatons that I showed you earlier on, this is not relevant globally. So 
our goal is to scale this up significantly over the next years and decades. But if we start with the process, um, so I promise you to explain a little bit of how this process works in the underground. And the ingredient we need here is really the basalt as this reactive rock in the underground. Basalt is very reactive, especially if it's young and porous, you can push water with CO2 through it and it's reactive. And what we need from it is calcium, magnesium, iron, these elements that we leach from it. And this happens by injecting CO2 dissolved in water into the underground. So it's kind of like sparkling water that you inject under pressure into the underground. And this slightly acidic water reacts then with the basaltic rocks and leaches these elements, calcium, magnesium, iron from the rocks. It combines them with the CO2 dissolved in this water. And over time, it forms carbonates. So these are solid rocks, solid minerals, calcium carbonate, uh, for example, calcite, magnesite, siderite. So it can take all of these three elements and more and combine with the CO2 and turn it into a stone. So this is what is behind this technology uh, on a high level. If we look at the whole technology, you know, from injection to uh, turning it into rocks in the underground, if you look at more the engineering part above ground, uh, this is an example of how it can look like, and uh, this is an example from the setup at the geothermal power plant in Hetlishedi here. So the power plant on the left there um, has water. There's plenty of water from the geothermal production there. We take the condensate, actually, and then we combine it with the emissions, which is CO2, but also H2S, uh, hydrogen sulfide, and, other, and toxic gas, and other gases, hydrogen as well, for example, and these uh, emissions combine with the water in the scrubbing tower. You can see it's pretty much a big shower. The water enters from the top, emissions from the bottom, and both of them then mix in the middle. And the water takes up the emissions. Um, here, this is the CO2 and the H2S. In this case, we actually not only we store and inject and turn the CO2 into rocks, we do the same with H2S. It's, uh, if you've been to Iceland, you would know it. It's this uh, foul egg smell. Um, yeah, hydrogen sulfide smell in high concentrations is also toxic. So you need to get rid of this as well. And the amazing part is that we can co-inject here CO2 with H2S and turn both of those into rocks in the underground. H2S then uh, would combine with iron and turn into pyrite in this example. So this is what happens there on the top and this mixture then, this gas charged water, this so to say sparkling water is injected into the underground and then it turns into stable carbonate minerals through these reactions with the rocks in the underground that I mentioned earlier. Now at Headless Haiti, since 2017, we, as I mentioned, we have this collaboration with Kleinworks and they capture CO2 in addition from the atmosphere. So this is then uh, the thing that can turn the geothermal power plant net negative in the end, like Scott mentioned. So not only kept, we capture the uh, emissions from the power plant, we also capture it from the air. And this is also injected with the rest of the stream into the underground and turned into rock. We have um, injected over 100,000 tons so far. This has been continuously operated since 2014. And for this particular case, the cost estimate um, for this you know, point source capture uh, and on-site injection is less than $25 a ton. Depending on exactly what you include, of course, it varies a little bit. For example, in this estimate of the injection uh, well was already there. There was pre-existing, so that's not included in $25 a ton. If you would add that to the mix, then you would end up with $28 a ton. Still not much. Uh, if we compare, for example, with the tax incentives in the US 45Q that some of you uh, are probably familiar with. So there's a tax incentive for storing uh, carbon in the underground. Um, called 45Q, where you get up to $50, uh, I think that's the latest number, per ton of CO2. So here on this example, we are already cost effective. Also in Europe, for example, there's the emission trading scheme, where I think at the moment the emission price is around 60, 70 euros or dollars per ton. So we are very cost efficient here. Uh, for this capture and on-site injection in this case. Of course, it depends on where exactly you capture it from. In this case, we capture from uh, geothermal gases where there's a high concentration of CO2. If you capture from air with Climeworks, um, you will have to ask them for the prices, but of course the price for this capture technology is a lot higher. <clears throat> so why mineral CO2 storage? 
uh, as I mentioned, it's a natural way. It's nature's way of storing carbon in rock. This has been happening over the geological past of the planet. We accelerate it. It's a low cost, as I just explained. And one thing is also that I didn't mention so far, it's very safe technology. The leakage risk is eliminated with instant solubility trapping in the underground. So we dissolve the CO2 in the water before or during injection. And it's dissolved in the underground and it's not buoyant. It doesn't come out by itself back to the surface. This is a uh, fundamental difference to conventional carbon capture and storage technologies where pure CO2 is injected much deeper into the underground, a couple of kilometers. In our case, that's only a couple hundred meters. And with conventional CCS, um, you need an impermeable layer of rocks above your storage reservoir to prevent the CO2 from coming back to the surface because the CO2 injected into the underground is less is buoyant and, and would just rise back if there's no layer preventing from doing it. With carb fix, we don't have this problem because we inject the CO2 dissolved in rocks trapping it uh, instantly in solubility. And then secondly, making it much more reactive and making it turn into rock in a couple of months, two years. The next point, innovative here. As I mentioned, uh, there is a firm scientific background. This project comes out of a collaboration between industry and academia. This is very different from many other startups where you kind of have an idea and you commercialize it immediately. And then you, know, you do all the science and figure out how this works. Um, in this time, in, in, in our case, this work uh, kind of the other way around, there is a lot of science. There has been many PhD theses, many papers, over 100 papers published on this. And then after this, uh, we started commercializing this technology. The stored capacity for this technique is uh, pretty much unlimited. It's much greater than needed for climate goals. And uh, so, the, so the reservoir, you know, the the kind of volume of rocks that you could store the CO2 in with this technology is much greater than what we could ever, ever want to store. And finally, yeah, it's permanent. Once you turn the CO2 into rocks, it's stable for millennia. So this is the best case scenario. You put the CO2 back into the geological reservoir, the geological cycle, um, where it's stable over millions of years. You don't need this long-term monitoring that you need for conventional CCS to make sure that the CO2 doesn't um, come through this impermeable layer above. This is not needed with our technology. So there's several advantages here, but of course, depending on exactly the location and, and so on, all of these technologies have their right to exist. Yeah, I just mentioned the global potential is larger than burning all fossil fuels on earth. So that's not the limit. The limit is more than the practicalities. Where can you do it? Um, where do you have the emissions? Where do you need the water? So one thing we need for carb fix is the water to dissolve the CO2 in. For every ton of CO2, um, a rough guideline would be 25 tons of water. So in Iceland, that's not a problem. It rains a lot, not on the picture behind me, but it, it really rains a lot, believe me. So freshwater resources are not a problem. We're looking currently into using seawater as well for this technology. I actually did um, lab experiments myself on validating this, and it works on the lab scale. This summer, we will go to the field and try this on a field pilot here onshore, not offshore, but with seawater onshore. But it all looks like this is working. And of course, this broadens the applicability of our technology a lot, because not everywhere you have unlimited freshwater resources, including islands like Hawaii as well. Um, you can look if you want on this uh, onto this storage atlas that we have on our website. And yes, Hawaii is also there and marked as basalt. So this is the kind of rock chemistry that we need, the geology that we need um, to apply carb fix. We have different um, kind of modes of how this can work. Uh, and and you know one interesting thing is also this is again uh, has parallels to Hawaii because we're sitting on an island here with limited emission sources really. So one of the limits, if we want to do it in Iceland, is really getting enough CO2 to make this climate relevant. <clears throat> so I showed you earlier this example of on-site capture and storage. Uh, this is the geothermal power plant here, for example, uh, example A. Example B would be to import CO2 from other places, um, transport it to a mineral storage hub and inject it into the underground then. And this is our biggest scale-up project at the moment, importing CO2 from Northern Europe by ship to Iceland and injected them at the coast here into the underground. And the plan is to inject there over uh, 3 million tons 
uh, very soon. And uh, we are actually drilling the first uh, injection wells here end of this year. And this will be hopefully starting in 2026 with the first ships arriving. And finally, the, the third solution then would be <clears throat> direct air capture because you have CO2 in the atmosphere everywhere. That doesn't matter where you are. If you have the energy for direct air capture, for example, renewables like geothermal, you can apply this any way you want if you have the right uh, geology in the underground. So it's kind of these three pathways to unlocking the storage potential at the gigaton scale, if we're talking about climate relevant numbers. On these pictures, you can see a couple examples of how this looks um, in nature. Uh, you can see part of our team here. And then also you can see these uh, sort of uh, spacey igloos. These are actually the, uh, the houses above the injection wells. <clears throat> and below these are the injection wells going down a couple hundred meters below the, uh, below the surface where the CO2 is injected. In the middle again, you can see the geothermal power plant and some pipelines uh, you know, leading the produced steam towards the power plant. And next to it, uh, we inject the CO2. On the top right, you can see this scrubbing tower that was on one of the diagrams earlier. So this is where the water from the power plant comes in from the bottom, uh, from the top. And the gases come in, uh, the emissions from the power plant come in from the bottom and they both mix and we resolve the CO2 and this uh, sulfur gas as well into this, in this tower from the power plant. And this is then further injected. And finally, on the bottom right, you can see a picture of uh, the plant from Climeworks, where they have these big fans pushing um, air through their machines, where there's a sorbent inside and a chemical that takes up the CO2 directly from the air, captures it, concentrates it, and then sends it to injection hole um, by, uh, operated by us, where we inject their CO2 from the air and turn it into stone in the underground. I was mentioning this terminal earlier, and here's a schematic diagram of how we envision this is, uh, this is working, and this is being you know, engineered now, and the construction are beginning. So there will be ships arriving with a CO2 in them. There's a temporary storage tank that is then filled up over time once the ship arrives. We mix it with the water um, in the injection well, and both are then injected into the underground. So the CO2 is dissolved in water and then turns uh, into stone into the underground. And this is a first of a kind CO2 mineral storage hub. Uh, so we're very excited about this. <clears throat> Here's a schematic diagram of how this then will work. We have partners that capture the CO2 and deliver it to us on, by ship then. So this can be from atmosphere, like by air capture. This can be from the power sector, industries, blue hydrogen, local emissions, and so on. And um, these are then transported by ship to Iceland, offloaded, conditioned, and then injected into the underground. You can see cost estimates here. Um, so you can see that kind of the offloading injection storage part uh, is around 15 to 20 dollars a ton uh, or euros a ton there sorry um, so that's fairly similar to the number i was showing earlier of course transporting co2 over long distance uh, distances adds to the price 20 to 44 dollars a ton is the current estimate um, working together with the shipping company then unity co2 that specializes now in building ships especially for transporting co2 to us <clears throat> And so, so you increase the price, of course, but it's still a very competitive estimate here. Uh, of course, this depends on the distance. If we talk again and again about high, uh, Hawaii compared to Iceland, here we have you know, a distance to Northern Europe. If you talk about Scotland, maybe some 2,000 kilometers. I think for Hawaii, that's roughly uh, double that. So of course, for something like this, is a question, is it worth it in the end? or with the strategy or rather be to capture emissions on Hawaii itself instead of transporting them to Hawaii. Also, of course, you have to think about how much CO2 do you emit by transporting CO2. In this case, we did the calculations and verified them. And uh, for our distances here, this is maybe some three or 4% of the CO2 that we store is emitted by transport. If we use not green fuels, of course, this could be reduced further. Um, so depending on what distances you look at, of course, this is less or more attractive. <clears throat> to sum this up, uh, climate action. We offer uh, a solution here to, uh, to certain parts of the world we, where we have the right geology, where we have energy, water, and so on. So this has to be studied individually. And CalPFIX offers you consultancy and also access to our IP for this technology to upscaling CO2 mineral storage. 
apart from this consultancy and uh, this scaling up projects, we have, as I mentioned, a lot of ongoing innovation focused on demonstrating this offshore. So this would be, you know, using salt and seawater instead of fresh water and other geological formations other than basalt. So with that, I'm done with my presentation and thank you again for this chance to present our solution and you know this very interesting parallel to Hawaii and uh, between Iceland. And feel free to contact us at uh, these email addresses that are here on this slide. And okay, that, Martin, I'm thank you so ahead. much. And I have a whole page of questions, but you answered virtually <clears throat> every single one of them. <clears throat> but I do have one from the chat and one that I had on my list that you didn't answer, but I know we've talked about. And that one is, um, are there any seismic issues with this process? Did you notice any increase in earthquakes or any kind of seismic activity when you start using this process? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And um, we're sitting here on a volcanic island, a very active one where we have triple junctions between different plates, volcanic activity that you're also familiar with. So it's naturally a very active seismic zone. So at, at this geothermal power plant, there is a lot of seismicity going on um, naturally, but also because of injection of the water from the power plant. So this is something that happened long before Carpvik started its activities. Um, and this is known to the local residents here as well. And there's a fairly good process here of you know having a sort of traffic light system where the power plant warns uh, residents if they change the operations if they change uh, the operations of the geothermal power plant reinjections and so on how this is handled and the public is fairly happy with this um, but yes there is a little bit of seismic activity here um, with the reinjection and pretty much anything you reinject into the underground uh, has the risk of causing seismicity and that's okay. Uh, yeah. But what we found is in studies that there's no additional risk by, you know, adding CO2 to the water. So um, there has been seismic analysis with a lot of data um, see, trying to see, is there any effect of adding CO2 and doing carb fix kind of um, to the seismicity? And there has not been any. So um, that's that part of the answer. Okay. And the other question from the, the chat was, um, you know, Hawaii and Iceland are pretty much alike in terms of a, the basalt um, substrate and, and such, but is there anything special about doing this in Iceland that would make it um, more effective than doing it in Hawaii? Like for example, would it take longer for the, the solidification of the carbon in the ground because of the temperatures in Iceland or something else? Or do you think that you get similar results in Hawaii as you do in Iceland in terms of injecting and having it turn into a rock form? No. No, I, I think this will be very similar compared uh, to Iceland and Hawaii. Um, I also just saw there's a question about, in general, the requirements of the geology. So there's two things that we need. Um, it's one is the right chemistry. So the type of rock and uh, that's, you know, the lowest hanging fruit for us is basalt. Iceland is basaltic, Hawaii is basaltic. So that's perfect. Um, so in, in that term, uh, you know, Hawaii is really a dream for us where to try this there. Um, the second requirement is that you need the porosity and the permeability of the underground to push this water with the CO2 dissolved into it. You know, if it's very dense rock without any fractures and pores, you cannot push anything through it. Um, again, the same thing. Iceland is a very young, active area where you have a lot of porosity in these young rocks and a lot of permeability, and you can do this. Same for Hawaii. It's young rocks where this is uh, very interesting. So, so in both of these characteristics that we need, this permeability porosity, and also the chemistry, this basaltic uh, uh, composition, uh, it's very similar. And, and in this way, you know, Iceland is, is a, the lowest hanging fruit, but Hawaii equally. Okay, thanks, Martin. You, you addressed also the freshwater issue. We do have a freshwater shortage here. So that would be a challenge, but you said you're going to be trying it with salt water soon and you'll have some results on that. We'd like to hear back from you when, when you come up with those results, because if we're going to get into it here, we may have the right geology, but we certainly would need to look at salt water as uh, the carrier for the, the carbon. Exactly, so, yes. So thanks for your presentation and staying up late tonight with us. And we're going to move on to Eugene Tien, um, the state's uh, economist and hand it over to Eugene for, for his presentation. Okay, let me share my uh, screen. Do you see my screen? Yeah. 
Yes, Eugene. Let me go uh, from uh, a slideshow. I will show you uh, the some numbers uh, about the uh, the carbon dioxide uh, emission in Hawaii. So um, the Department of Health, they uh, by law, they um, need to produce a report. Uh, they have produced a report uh, since 1990, uh, but not every year. In, uh, few years in incremental, but in recently they have uh, done this report every year. So the latest report released uh, last year is for 2017. So I have the two uh, pie chart to show that uh, by sector, the uh, greenhouse uh, gas is mainly coming, is about 86% coming from the energy sector. And from the energy sector is mainly is coming from the carbon dioxide. And uh, this slide shows for this pie chart, it shows that energy sector, uh, remember is 86%. But of that 86% and 87% is coming from transportation. And the transportation is mainly uh, is coming from the petroleum. So the concentration is actually uh, is on uh, transportation and petroleum. Uh, because Hawaii uh, in the petroleum use is about uh, 63% uh, in 2019, for example, 63% uh, um, of the petroleum were used for transportation. So 25% used for electricity generation. And look at it, the Hawaii uh, energy related uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, so we look at the historical since 1970. And the trend is that uh, whenever we have economic growth and the average growth is about 2% for those years. If you look at the uh, 1970s, the, when the economy grew faster at 4.2%, the carbon dioxide uh, content increase. And in the 1980s, 66% of economic growth and also increase in the uh, carbon dioxide. And so, uh, and it's true for the uh, most recent growth in the uh, mid, mid 2000. So we had a uh, 4% economic growth and we also see an uh, increase. But uh, since uh, during the last five years, we see the economic growth is about 1.2%. And the carbon dioxide is pretty much leveled. And what happened to the uh, carbon intensity? So this means that uh, how much of uh, carbon dioxide we produce for per dollar of real GDP. And actually Hawaii uh, has been leading the nation. You can see Hawaii is the blue. The nation is actually the red. Hawaii has been below, that means we use, uh, we actually produce uh, less carbon dioxide in order to, print, uh, to produce $1 worth of the real GDP. So, but if you see the lines, uh, the United States and Hawaii, it narrows in recent years. So um, I think the US overall is doing good now because um, I think Hawaii is uh, slowing improvement, um, but uh, uh, US is improving faster. Actually, Hawaii, uh, when we uh, look at the uh, productivity of uh, energy, uh, we call the energy intensity uh, of the economy. That means uh, to produce $1 of GDP. In 1990, uh, in 2000, Hawaii would need about 40. 4,800 um, metric tons, uh, no, a BTUs, 4,800 BTUs to produce $1. But in 2019, uh, that number reduced to about 3,700. So from 4,800 to 3,700 to produce uh, $1 of GDP. So the energy use is actually, uh, is pretty uh, efficient currently. Let's move on to the, uh, uh, next slide, and uh, we look at the per capita energy uh, related uh, carbon dioxide emission. So um, it's, it's about the uh, similar trend. 
uh, but Hawaii in terms of per person is, has been below the US. Uh, we rank somewhere in the middle, about the 24th lowest in the nation among all the state. And uh, what Hawaii has been done, and we have in the past 10 years, uh, 20 years, Hawaii actually has passed a lot of uh, legal, a lot of laws uh, building, uh, you know, mostly it's in the uh, policy uh, aspect. I think rather than uh, not so much concentrated on the technology, I think I'm uh, happy to see the Iceland is uh, the technology is mainly from the technology side. When I see Martin's uh, background picture, that reminded me about when I was young, I was uh, living in the place with a lot of snows. I haven't seen snows uh, for three decades. So uh, I, I, I feel those, uh, it is uh, make me to feel the, to think about the, the young, a, a younger age. So uh, what the Hawaii has been doing in terms of uh, the uh, reducing the carbon dioxide, mostly we are concentrated on the uh, policy issue. And we have built uh, by law, we have built, uh, established tax forces and symposiums. Uh, we have the uh, greenhouse gas sequestration tax force, and we have a carbon uh, offset symp symposium is all done by Office of Planning. The agencies in charge, uh, we have the state energy office. We heard from um, Scott Glenn today, and we have the Office of Planning and they actually have a report uh, published in 2019. It's called the feasibility and the implications of establishing a carbon offset program for the state of Hawaii. And that is the result of those uh, tax force and the symposium. It's a well-written report. And we also have a University of Hawaii uh, Economic Research Organization as uh, latest as uh, uh, April, 20, uh, April 19th, um, they actually post uh, an article on carbon tax. So they recommended, uh, so this, that is an effective way to reduce the carbon dioxide. So if the carbon tax uh, at about uh, $56 per metric ton in 2025 and increase to 79 dollars per metric ton in 2045, that would reduce the carbon dioxide uh, content by about 10%. And uh, the money uh, received from the, from the tax revenue will be distributed to the uh, Hawaii household. So all the household, especially the poor, they will receive a, a, a couple hundred dollars per year and my division, we call the Research and Economic Analysis Division. Uh, we also produce a series of energy reports. We have the energy trend and we, uh, re we release on a monthly basis. And most recently, we work with the University of Hawaii and we produce a, uh, a indicator called the GPI, which is called Genuine Progress Indicator. So that measure the uh, community well-being not only by economics, but also include environmental, uh, include also social justice. So that's uh, uh, three indicators. And we are launching our website uh, uh, next week. And we'll show the uh, last 20 years uh, what Hawaii's uh, uh, GPI uh, numbers from 2000 to 2020. So uh, you can see that from economic perspective, from environmental social justice, how these uh, progress. And we have uh, uh, many other agencies. And for example, the Honolulu County, they have the Climate Change Sustainability and Residency Office. We have so many nonprofit and private organizations and, and the list going on and on. So, but what we are doing currently in terms of programs we have the state renew renewable energy portfolio standard. So that is in, uh, by uh, 2045 will be 100% uh, uh, renewable energy for electricity generation. And we have a few tax credit. And uh, for example, the energy, uh, we always call the solar energy tax credit. 
on the top of federal credit, the state offered me credit. It has been the largest tax credit among all the tax credit offered in the state. And we have a renewable fuel production tax credit, and we have uh, also carbon pricing. And that means we, uh, for example, the, the barrel tax is a part of it. And we also have the loan program is managed by a program within DBET. We have building codes standards that's managed by the energy office. And we have other plans. And um, you know, the list will go on and on. And, on. and uh, in terms of uh, the carbon reduction, there are other means to reduce. And this is all concentrated on the uh, policy or uh, there is uh, marketing, there is a market uh, for this uh, uh, carbon credit and you can treat it. And, and there are three market, uh, main market in the North America, uh, California, there is one or two in uh, Canada. And uh, for those uh, projects, uh, they need to register those uh, regist uh, registry, uh, registries, they need to uh, verify and they will go through the procedures uh, and work with those uh, market. And I did uh, check uh, those listings by those three registries. I actually only uh, see only one project uh, is the city county Honolulu uh, solid waste project uh, that was listed in one of the three uh, registries, uh, but that project was registered in 2003 and will be ended by 2023. Is the status is still under, uh, is still, um, it, it's not final, it's, uh, it's still um, under review. And we have other projects uh, like uh, the DLNR, they have two uh, projects, a uh, forestry project. And we have the uh, private sector, we have the sustainability business forum, and they have, uh, about a few uh, businesses, they put money together and they want to uh, start with the uh, their carbon offset initi initiative uh, program. I think that is all I have uh, for the uh, status of what is happening in the state. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have. Thanks, thanks Eugene and you know, um... Henry Curtis brought up a, a really important point as we look at all your data. And it, it's been mentioned by Scott and by Martin, and I'm sure it'll come up in a, a little bit later on, but <clears throat> the fact that Hawaii has very little manufacturing or, or big industry, we don't have a whole lot of pollution that we generate, but that is offset by all of the things we import that are manufactured other places on big ships that are actually producing a lot of carbon and emitting a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. So even though our numbers look impressive compared to the continental US in terms of our, meeting our goals to be below uh, green, on greenhouse gas emissions, um, it's actually a great segue into Keone and, and Scott's uh, uh, Wong's presentations. We need to find ways that if Hawaii wants to be more sustainable and have some of its own production um, increase in our own agricultural production. We have to make sure that we keep our own carbon footprint low. And, and that way we'll be able to offset our carbon by not importing a lot of things. So in a, in a bottom line sense, if we want to really reduce it, it's efficiency. As we develop our own industries in Hawaii, we have to be more efficient. We have to be conscious of making the use of everything we have here and, and making sure we don't increase our carbon footprint as we decrease all the things being shipped in. And with that, that's a good introduction to Keone Ford, who's going to talk about um, carbon from a, a local perspective and what he's doing and Scotty Wong are doing to um, help us increase our sustainable uh, Hawaii um, system, but not increase our pollution and our contributions to greenhouse gases. So Keone, take it away. Aloha mai kako. Uh, thank you, Stan and Michael and, and everyone at Renew Rebuild Hawaii for having this discussion and talking point. Um, 
it's a beautiful day here in Hawaii. Thank you, Martin, for joining us all the way from Iceland. Uh, I think the work that that is taking place there is absolutely remarkable. Um, and I think there are some direct parallels, and I think it's a it's a great lens to to jump from a discussion of carbon capture and storage sequestration um, to my talking point, mine and Scotty's uh, discussion and talking point, and that's uh, carbon capture, storage and utilization. So CCSU, and then building a platform. And so I, you know, I kind of want to keep this at like a very STEM level, fifth grade uh, level of viewpoint, because we're in our effort to do carbon recovery. Um, we're recognizing that plants love carbon dioxide. Um, our soil structures are the best kept secret for our ability to sequester um, carbon dioxide, and we store that in, in, in nutrient dense fields. So. Um, Keeping it at that level, uh, we are looking at carbon farming versus chemical farming and how the applications of carbon dioxide can best suit um, where we are in Hawaii, and that's a food and energy security uh, position. So I, I kind of want to focus really on the on how we got here and, and, and what DIB's role is in carbon dioxide. Our company was formed in 2009. Uh, DIBS is a military is acronym for dry ice blasting service. Uh, we, we came from a carbon neutral stance um, and I'm gonna use the word carbon offsets. We're hearing it a lot. Um, using dry ice, carbon dioxide is dry ice, is pure CO2. And uh, we, we wanted to use a medium uh, that would allow us to not add any additional secondary waste stream. And so our ability to clean um, critical tolerances, surfaces, power plants, uh, we cleaned the geothermal plant when it had its meltdown. We cleaned all the electrical connections. Um, and so we, we brought dry ice in to do these things and there's no secondary waste stream. So we've been doing this for about 13 years now. And so because our business is based around dry ice, um, that's pure carbon dioxide, that would make us a a consumer of carbon dioxide. So without carbon dioxide, we don't really have a business. And so the talking points now that is global is we're in a carbon dioxide crisis. Climate change adaptability programs are global. Um, every country is having to pivot to these Hawaii included. Um, so, you know, we began this work uh, for the military, for the Navy to help them address some of the most critical environmental problems. Uh, we're at introducing water, chemicals, sand, and those additional waste streams. Um, and then, of course, the cost of uh, the fuel to dispose of those off our islands. So by using dry ice to clean with no secondary waste stream, we eliminated point of source. And so that, that allows us to focus on offsets. So that's kind of our background of, you know, where we started and where we are now. Um, you know, I've experienced a carbon dioxide crisis here in the state of Hawaii for the last decade, not having enough CO2 to, to actually expand our business, expand our operations. Um, I'd like to highlight that everyone in the state of Hawaii um, should be very familiar with CO2. It's in our soft drinks, our beverages and our accessibility to have that. So we're very familiar with carbon dioxide when it comes to our consumption, but when it comes time to our production, well, we, we don't really have enough. And so critical industries um, like myself, if we don't have the ability to secure the carbon dioxide, we don't have the ability to utilize and expand it. Um, some of those being uh, the growth of algae, using CO2 to promote uh, cellular growth in plants, uh, sequestration using uh, carbon mineralization, carbon cure, DOT, making sustainable jet fuel. So there's not enough uh, cold chain logistics. That's a really big thing. We don't have dry ice in uh, local communities. Vulnerable communities do not have access to CO2 dry ice. It's, so it's, it's a complete luxury item. Um, our ability to offset, and I wanna go back to that, the import substitution aspect is, is profound. And our ability, it changes Hawaiian lifestyle. If there was dry ice available at, let's say, a Costco in Maui, that person from Hana could stay longer. Um, they could, their trip would change, their ability to address perishables, their food items, 
Um, less trips could be taken. It would change lifestyle. Uh, the fishing boats would be able to stay on the water longer. They could package their food. We could export out quality products if we had dry ice. We don't have those things available. So I think when we take a look at import substitution, it touches a lot of subjects, especially now that we're looking at um, our oil and our firm power is starting to shift. So we're seeing our fertilizers, our chemical farming is we're completely dependent on these imports, these fossil fuels. So going back to the basics, um, you know, we wanted to use CO2 in such a way to one, lift agriculture to grow food. Um, CO2 and food are, go hand in hand. Um, when it rains, things grow. And so Scotty's gonna be briefly mentioning about the farming aspect of CO2, but I'm gonna go just say that what we're doing, the work we're doing with Senate Bill 2865 is to create a virtual terminal. Um, I'm sure the, the, heart, the heartache, the hardships of not having enough CO2, but well, what do we need to do? Well, we need to have a third party CO2 infrastructure, a virtual pipeline that allows us to recover CO2 if we're to collect the emissions. And the state of Hawaii, our, for our, our energy use, collectively across the state, we're looking at three to 3.5 million tons of CO2 emitted a day. I mean, I mean, a year annually from our burning of energy. And so even if we're our ability to recover a fraction of that, um, knowing that we have to import our CO2 from California to do outside industries because there's just not enough, it really puts a focus on what do we really need? Well, we need a virtual pipeline, a terminal, a means to store the CO2 that it can be utilized on each island so we can direct it towards agriculture. We can direct it towards environmental cleaning using the dry ice, cold chain logistics, storage, research, uh, growing algaes, food production, uh, sequestration via concrete, and of course the uh, hot topic, sustainable jet fuel. Um, so when, we, when we're proposing to do a net zero carbon capture storage utilization platform, if we're gonna be dealing with carbon, as Scott mentioned, and I wanna give, I wanna thank the Hawaii State Energy Office and Scott Glenn for being a really great ear and listening and allowing for us to have a position to take a stance to evaluate CO2 from a different lens, from a utilization standpoint. And so this utilization proponent, we wanna make sure that we're doing it net zero. We're wanting to meet the, the state's objectives. So we found that by pairing with ag, with industrial hemp in particular, uh, it's a food and energy crisis. Uh, by pairing with hemp, which also has a bad, a bad um, rap, um, CO2 needs hemp, hemp needs CO2. By increasing both of these at an agricultural site, we're increasing cellular growth by 30%. Um, we're sequestering in the carbon and we're addressing a really big problem which Scotty is gonna talk about and that's our, new, our, our soil's health. So for a hundred years, our ag, we exported out through our sugarcane, our pineapple, the, the life of our soil systems and now we're trying to pivot back. And so what we realized is that our soil systems actually has no carbon in it. And so by using hemp as a means to revitalize the soil systems, to put carbon back in, the biomass to go in, um, Dibs Hawaii in partnership with the Consortium of Native Hawaiian Businesses, uh, we chose to use biomass as our net zero energy input. So we came up with this acronym called HEMP. So the first part of the H is the harvesting. We want to harvest that biomass, that hemp, uh, which the farmers are going to be growing for brownfielding. Uh, we want to convert that hemp into energy. That's the E part. And that energy, we're going to create ethanol and E100 fuel, um, dragsters, NASCAR, Le Mans, F1 uh, race cars, they all burn this really high grade fuel. That emissions from the burning of this fuel from our power generation that we made from our own biomass. So this activity is happening on site. The CO2 is being stored on site, supporting this activity. We'll be collecting the CO2 emissions off the exhaust of the power that we're creating net zero from being in partnership 
with the hemp. So we have the harvest, that's the H, E is the energy created, the ethanol, and then the M is the managing. We're managing those waste streams. We're taking the CO2 that's coming off the exhaust stream. Much like was discussed earlier, we're putting into a wet scrubber, and then the water that's distilled out from the process of creating the fuel for ourselves is mixed in to basically create an acidic water, and we're mimicking rain and we're increasing the parts per million, at which point that we're mimicking the rainwater, that earthly function, and we're allowed to put it right back into the fields which we're already sourced at. And so that's the M part, which is the management of our waste streams. And then of course the P, we wanna be able to prepare the soil and by using biochar, which is a, as a carbon smart uh, commodity, also carbon credits related to that, uh, microbial health nutrients, um, Dibs Hawaii, in partnership with his consortium, is able to go back and tap into some of those native Hawaiian roots around agriculture, taking care of the aina, and actually putting carbon back into the soil for the next generations, for the next 100 years, and starting to compound it um, at a level from 200 centimeters and beyond. So we're just going into what we can visibly scale, reach, and we can track. So via the CCSU, we have the ability to recover the carbon, um, we'll import it to start, but there's so much CO2 to recover. And if there's a pipeline to accept it, we can start to work with our industries here, whether it be the power industry, the refineries, um, and other industries that are gonna be um, emitting CO2. So uh, our ability to, to do net zero, carbon negative, meet these goals, do the cleaning without secondary waste stream, the offsets and support lift up ag as the big proponent. Um, we're really excited to uh, be participating uh, with this Native Hawaiian Consortium and this creative effort to build economies in all communities where this can be pivoted, putting a tank in an agricultural site, making dry ice to support that movement of those products. And of course, the disaster preparedness in the event of hurricanes, um, when we need cold chain logistics storage, when the when the lights go out, do we have dry ice available in those communities? So um, that's kind of in a nutshell what we're doing um, in regards to Dips Hawaii and the CCSU platform. And I'd love to pass it on to Scotty because I think what they're doing in their vision and the farming mm -hmm. uh, as we work together to do carbon farming is extraordinary. And I'm just so honored and privileged to be a resident of the state of Hawaii, a native Hawaiian living here and providing a solution um, that we can feed our, um, grow people, grow, we're growing people so that we can grow a future for tomorrow that has nutrient dense food and nutrient dense soil systems and clean energy, um, highlighting the, the goals and the objectives of the state energy office and the things that Scott Glenn talked about. So mahalo nui. Keone, thanks for your presentation and Kind of reminds me a little bit, although it wasn't quite as clean as as your your um, hemp description. But back in the days of sugar, um, the sugar cane they burn off the leaves in the field and put some uh, some of that back into the soil. They used all of the bagasse what they got out of the sugar cane that once they squeezed all the the sugar out of it, they used that to generate electricity. And then the ash from that also went back into the field to become part of the biosphere and reproduce. So it was actually even better than the pineapple industry in terms of keeping the soil rich. But I'm sure that Scott can even go farther than that and talk about what, what's going on now. So thanks for your presentation and a good, good lead in for Scott's presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you guys, aloha. Um, um, I'm Scotty Wong. And uh, I'm the CEO of Ohana Hui Ventures Incorporated. And I see some of my friends on here that remember me as a, a, a film union guy. I used to run the film union here in Hawaii um, several years ago. And Ohana Hui Ventures got started in, in 2016, 2017, first as a company that was looking for land to build uh, Hawaii's first state-of-the-art film studio privately owned. But after looking at 20 and 30, 40 acres worth of land, I looked at it and says, you know, it's it's kind of kind of sad to be putting buildings on here to make movies. Um, and that's when we we linked up with um, partners that were into agriculture. And uh, so we focused our attention on to to different types of agriculture. But currently we serve as a consortium of, as Keone has said, of local indigenous companies engaged in the field of agriculture. 
Uh, now, one thing, we are not a government organization or a large energy company, but we represent local Kanaka food farmers, ranging from small to medium outputs of various Asian vegetables of over, is, is about over a half a million pounds of produce a year. Um, and, th and that's small for, for our guys, but that's who we're, we're representing, the small underserved farmers. Uh, we are also bringing on small underserved local organic farmers for indigenous Hawaiian crops such as kalo, uh, uwala, ulu, niu, and Hawaiian heirloom bananas uh, is something that we just added to our list. Um, we also retain uh, local industrial hemp farmers who have moved uh, and farmed cannabis in California and Oregon for the last 10 years to include Hawaii once Hawaii started their hemp pilot program, I believe it was 2019-2020. Uh, my guys are preparing to plant over 100 acres uh, for Keone uh, to start this project uh, this year of industrial hemp with uh, varieties uh, uh, known as Puma and Yuma, uh, very popular uh, strains from China that is, is used mainly around the world for fiber. Um, this grow will also further and prove phytoremediation properties of hemp on land that has been subject to what we talked about monocropping uh, lands that have heavy pesticides and fertilizers uh, the growing of hemp itself is also our way of immediately sequestering carbon uh, out of the atmosphere as most of you guys may have known if you googled anything about hemp uh, an acre of of industrial hemp uh, can sequester up to four to five tons an acre uh, or for those from europe 15 tons of uh, a hectare uh, that's according to various verified studies from around the world. Uh, our goal in this area of fighter remediation is to, to look at a lot of the big landowners uh, to help phyto remediate their lands that are sitting. Uh, we're collaborating with Kamehameha Schools. We spoke to OHA. We spoke to uh, Department of Hawaiian Homelands. The, obviously, some of you know, if you looked at the lands, there's a lot of fields that are just sitting but what we don't know is it's sitting because it's brown fields. And we need to clean that up so that we can open that up uh, and remediate it. Uh, so then it can be used for farming nutrient dense foods again. Um, also, we are moving onto our farm currently. Uh, my partners have just submitted a, 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 a planning um, for a local green waste recycling team that produces wood chips, compost, and high grade organic soil. And this is a, another Kanaka owned uh, company here in, in, in Hawaii. Uh, we plan for them to also assist us in clearing invasive trees from our farms uh, to produce the char. And once mixed with our farm made worm tea, which is another local guy that's going to help us with um, uh, the beekeeping and worm tea uh, and other inoculants that we can science and research uh, to add to the mix of this, we can create biochar to our farmlands, creating nutrient rich soils for decades to come. Um, our vision uh, doesn't just limit us to, to farming on land. Uh, we have established a partnership with uh, New Island Farm Solutions, John Braley, who's on this, uh, on this uh, Zoom today, um, which specializes in cubic farms and hydrogreen technology, which brings us to uh, types of indoor growth systems that, um, that we'll, we'll, we felt will really work well with net zero energy, because for these indoor growth systems, you, you need power. You need power to run them. And what we don't want to do is be on the on on the grid that's burning fossil fuels, uh, just putting CO2 back in the air, but uh, using this net energy to power the operation and also CO2 sequestering and utilization um, of that of that that operation, we can produce foods grown in a vertical aeroponic systems. Um, Ohana Hui Ventures is operating currently on 400 acres of agribusiness development corporation land in the Whitmore Village area. Uh, these are lands that hasn't been farmed in over 15 years since being used for pineapple and other various uh, farm operations for over the last 80 years or so. But the good thing is this gives us a blank canvas to grow organic and use regenerative farming practices of no-till and diversifying our crops with the introduction of, of cattle from our other local partner. We also plan to utilize our warehouse space. We have about 20,000 square feet of warehouse space up at the ADC uh, that we can put uh, the initial pilots uh, programs of the indoor growth. Also create food processing uh, centers and cold storage for our, our farmers because our produce gotta go somewhere. Uh, so 
where is our carbon sequestration operation? So OHV plans uh, to serve as the on-location pilot program for Dips Hawaii and Ho'olu Holdings. Uh, it's been just about a year since, since uh, Keone and his team and I have, have first spoke about uh, remediation of land, clearing land on the Big Island, using that green waste to uh, put back into renewable fuels or net zero energy, and then um, using uh, industrial hemp. So from, from there, we, we're here where we're at today, um, looking at the Whitmore lands to, to actually have a place for you guys to see this and touch it and see it in action. Um, aside from farming produce and using regenerative farming practices uh, to naturally sequester the carbon, um, like I said, we, we represent local farmers, uh, small farmers that plan to set the example of how to add um, the technologies that Ho'olu Holdings and Keone them are going to bring in, uh, such as uh, e-fuelers uh, to utilize our industrial hemp and green waste to create ethanol that will fuel our farm equipment and power walls to get us off fossil fuel burning grids and can power our indoor grows and processing areas. So when I was looking at Martin and seeing that their energy up there in, in Iceland is, is publicly owned, imagine us here in Hawaii, uh, Kanaka farmers on a small scale that have these um, uh, net zero energy technology on our farms. We have a CO2 tank on our farm. We're capturing our own energy and creating our own energy for the local farmer. Uh, one thing that I told farmers before, and they told me, is one thing that doesn't stop if they have a failed crop is their water bill and their electric bill and all of that. So if we can look at these different solutions to bring to the farmers, uh, that's, that's less expenses that, uh, for them and will help them succeed in the future. Um, these, these power walls also that Keone them, um, you know, have been talking to me about can also be deployable throughout the farm it can be coupled with one of the new technologies that we also brought in, which is the ACFO atmospheric water generators that farms moisture from the atmosphere, creating fresh, clean drinking water. Um, one of the biggest machines we have uh, is can produce up to 130 to 140 gallons a day. So if you stack four or five of these machines on your farm powered by the net zero energy, then you won't have to worry about ditch water, municipal water, or having clean water for drinking or washing your produce to meet the gap food safety requirements. Uh, it's not a replacement for ag or municipal water, but a great piece of technology to add considering the water crisis, and I think it was mentioned before, considering the water crisis we are currently experiencing uh, in other parts of the world, such as California. Um, we plan to be a net negative example in Hawaii on combining traditional sequestering through forestry, uh, farming and cattle to adopting these net zero energy systems, which not only sequesters carbon, but provides clean energy and creates climate smart commodities. By utilizing the stored carbon and creating the ethanol, the dry ice, the CO2 infused water, which all can be used in our cold chain logistics, in our fields and on our produce, our produce now with our local farmers, um, now become uh, or further creates more climate smart commodities. So those of you that have been looking at the newest USDA grant that came out, uh, I think in January, where the USDA is putting a billion dollars and you can request up to hundred million dollars a piece if you can show them what you're doing with carbon sequestering and how you're turning that carbon into climate smart commodities and how you're marketing it out there and how you're bringing in underserved farmers to utilize this technology in practice. So as you can see from my presentation, we're right on track with that. And we're actually putting in for that, for that USDA grant because Hawaii, I think, and what we're doing right now with Ho'ulu uh, Holdings and Dibs Hawaii, uh, we fit that grant. But in closing, we wanna say that the last piece of our operation uh, is to start training uh, programs to teach our people. Uh, we utilize our nonprofit 501c3 called Friends of Waimanalo, which I'm the chief operating officer with, with uh, Scotty Reese Moniz. And basically, Friends of Waimanalo uh, is cre was created for as a workforce development. Um, and what we want to do is create the programs with Keone and his team for new jobs that will be created. And that's, I think, the key factor that was, wasn't mentioned is that a lot of this technology has to be taught to the future generations, whether they're in seventh grade or 10th grade 
because this, what we're doing today needs to be done in the future. And if we can start that with our locals on small farms and in the schools uh, to, to really um, uh, push this, this practice for generations to come to take care of our land and our agriculture, our soil, our environment, uh, this is key. This is the, the missing factor. Um, so like our ancestors who sailed the largest body of ocean seeking the smallest specks of land, um, before people even knew the earth was round, uh, we as Polynesians is well suited with adapting to these new technologies uh, to better our food production, use of firm power, and reducing greenhouse gases. And with that, I want to say thank you for letting me present and introduce uh, who Ohanahui Ventures is today. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Scotty. And, you know, at risk of turning this into a really big long discussion i wanted to i want to ask a question it could be from scott glenn to answer or keone or scotty wong um we have a project on the big island honua ola which is a it represents about a half a billion dollars investment in in generating electricity from all those eucalyptus trees that were planted in place of sugarcane but they're basically i don't want to call them an invasive species but they're they were a planted species that is too close together to really grow into a crop and it's all reaching maturity and Honua Ola wants to turn it into something usable. What do you think of their process in terms of carbon? Do you think they've addressed the carbon sequestration part um, enough? Because they seem to be getting a lot of pushback about being too carbon positive and, and, and it, a lot of people don't like what they're doing but a lot of us think it's probably a, a good idea. What what is are your feelings, Keone or, or Scott or Scott Glenn, about Honua Ola? I'm Scott may not be able to answer because it's political, but maybe Keone and Scotty Wong could could talk to that. I I I'd be happy to to address that and um, and I I want to um, I want to thank the people of the Hamoko coastline for being really patient. Um, when I look at the Hono Ola project, I do see something that was led by uh, a big front for Native Hawaiians and a community and creating jobs and tackling a really complex problem, which is the eucalyptus is, is a, was, a, was a crop. It was an agricultural crop 30 years ago. It was sugarcane. And so um, I know that the plant was constructed very well to a very high standard with equipment, with the people that did it at the time, the technology was what it was. Um, it solves a problem. My view is that if there was the ability to recover the, the carbon dioxide from the burning of trees, if the CO2 emissions, the scrubbing of CO2 to take place with that, and then they now become uh, a, C, a, a carbon recovery point, you know, the virtual terminal is really in the place to get to get up to speed because I'm sure they'd like to be able to recover the CO2, but they don't have a virtual pipeline to terminal to plug into, which is why we're really off to the races right now for us to just establish 400 tons of CO2 storage tanks. That's really what it is. It's a race for us to just get tanks. So if we could support the CO2 tanks and the recovery of that, imagine all the, I mean, the algae production that could be grown to, for energy. I mean, bioast and how many people take bioast? And, you know, I would hate for my kupuna not to get that. And they're incredibly dependent on CO2. So there's so many measures and means where we're, we're never going to have enough CO2 to meet all of the applications that Hawaii can utilize it to benefit our people. We have thousands of acres of ag land, thousands of, of those acres are, you know, in a position where it's fallow. And, you know, we didn't really highlight too much on it, but the, the fact that they're in the forest, in the trees, by carbon farming and doing carbon, basically going in subterranean and putting carbon nutrient micro piles of biochar and CO2 enrichment, we're, we're first of all, we're addressing like a water consumption, water retention, biochar retains water. It also stores nutrients. So I think it works hand in hand. Their efforts to be in the forest doing these efforts are very positive. But if we could couple that with some of the things that we're doing now around the carbon farming and injecting, not, not injecting be like into the water table, literally 200 to 300 centimeters deep 
building down that biomass for that rich soil structure, that's something that we can actually tangibly see. You know, we can store a 50 ton tank of CO2 on site on their facility and say, this is how much CO2 re we recovered today. And then at the same time, we can say, this is how much we utilize today. And then we can have a metrics in the soil. This is how many tons of CO2 we have at a subterranean level on our agricultural lands. And I think that Hawaii is in a unique position to be incredibly transparent to the carbon credit, to play to the carbon offsets, and ultimately to address um, import substitution, at which point um, Hawaii gets to showcase that we are producers more than we are consumers. And that's a really positive thing. And we want to grow people who have a mindset of being a producer versus just a consumption mindset of imports. Um, but yeah, I, I think that there's a unique opportunity to, to make it right, but you have to be able to recover the carbon. You just have to. So, I think so, so if I understand right then, the way they intend to use it is they're going to make lumber from some of the eucalyptus that's suitable for building materials, which means we don't have to ship in as much lumber from the mainland and we don't impact those forestry projects on the mainland by using a crop that we basically are trying to get rid of right now anyway. But we need to improve the carbon capture on the production end. And Honua Ola is supposed to be making electricity. That's why they're tied up with a PUC. They're supposed to be making electricity for HECO. So they're also trying to use a more uh, cost-friendly, environmentally friendly way of making electricity. And I guess even their, their leaves and stuff go into cattle feed and the bigger agricultural system you talked about, CUNY. So Scotty uh, Wong, what kind of feedback do you have for Honua Ola? Uh, I'll just leave it with Keone since he's actually been up there on, on the ground. <laughs> okay. But, but that's I the think thing too is with our, our project and our technology, uh, being that this is, is something that can be duplicated and replicated, uh, this is something that we can take to the neighbor islands and we plan to take to the neighbor islands for them to utilize what, what we're doing with uh, Dips Hawaii and Ho'olu. Okay. And I see Scott Glenn pop back in. Do you want to have say something, Scott? Yes, Dan. Um, first, I think with that specific project, it's in front of the PUC right now. So we're waiting to see what they think about the greenhouse gas emissions as part of their decision making. So at this point, it's really up to them to evaluate the arguments put in front of them and we'll we'll see which way they go. Okay. Um, I would like to kind of step back though and frame a little bit the comments that we heard from Martin and what Keone's proposing that um, CO2 is, you can kind of put it into a couple of different buckets, but one way to think about it is CO2 that's buried in the ground now that we never want to bring out and we want to avoid having to bring out as much as possible. And unfortunately, we're not in that situation. We're still in the right. situation where we're pulling CO2 out of the ground in the form of oil and natural gas and coal, and we're burning it and we're releasing it. And because of the externalities that we don't pay for, it's artificially cheap. And so it's it's there, it's it's abundant in that sense. But that's that's CO2 that should be locked away and, and it's not in what's called the active carbon cycle. And so when we're talking about the activities like Keone and Scott described, they're looking at using the active carbon that's already in the atmosphere. Ideally, that's where we wanna to get to. But they're also talking right now about that transition of using emissions right now that are happening that are being put into the carbon cycle because they're not in it right now they're coming from underground in the form of fossil fuel and they're being injected into the active carbon cycle and heating our planet and trying to get a couple more uses out of it before it goes into the atmosphere and where i think long term we need to do is is flip that to where the carbon we're using for our industrial and agricultural needs is ultimately carbon that's already in the active cycle and we're pulling it out, putting it through some uses and putting it back in, or even better, putting it through some uses and then putting it permanently back underground and taking it out of the active cycle. And so that's that's where I, does that help kind of think about? I, I, I think so, except that I think Keone's point, maybe Scott's too, is that um, that agriculture is a part that keeps that CO2 in a proper cycle that's in balance with nature already. I mean, the plants benefit from growth of the using the CO2 to make oxygen that we breathe. 
It doesn't um, right so, now because it depends on fossil fuel based fertilizers. And as long as we're using fossil fuel based fertilizers, we're contributing to the plant. The but I think that's the main point. They're trying to minimize the use of exactly. those other systems. Right. And and so that that's it. That's why this this whole discussion is really important, because, again, it gets back to efficiency and it gets back to maintaining a more natural cycle where where we reutilize the carbon that we have in positive ways right and a minute and like i say burning fossil fuel is like burning hundred dollar bills and yes. we, we have a, a gentleman on the line right now i asked him how much a barrel of oil was really worth and he said twelve thousand dollars a barrel if not more and that's like that they hit your point you know scott right on the nose we don't appreciate the energy and the value that's in a barrel of oil. We've got cheap energy, we've been exploiting it and we've been throwing it in the air like nothing. And we need to get back to more natural cycles. Yeah. And I think Keone and them are, they're hitting on an important point of how right. we do that. Right, which we is to, to use nature-based cycles in active carbon that's already in the atmosphere, using correct. natural processes to move it between used and released right and that's that's where i think we went ahead and ideally that's the longer term solution right great well that leads us into our last presenter uh, dr stephen allen who's got a, a real short presentation and maybe he can even kind of hone us in tighter on that discussion so doc we'll let you take it over great. Uh, thank you stan i'll uh share my screen here and get this going there we go yeah so i'm going to provide a, a bit of a summary of, of what we've been talking about and um, keep it relatively short here so we're generally familiar with the sources for the greenhouse gases the a lot of people think of the power plants and so forth you can't forget the uh, individual sources, uh, mostly transportation, and as uh, Henry Curtis has been mentioning, includes the airplanes, the aviation, and the ships, and so forth. So this is the whole uh, schematic for what we've been talking about. We have our CO2 uh, being produced. It gets captured either from a single point source or from uh, the air directly. There's a purification process. This is our dry ice or solid CO2. Typically, then it'll be transported somewhere, uh, could be uh, quite a distance or relatively short. And then as we heard about uh, in Iceland, we have the storage. This is our calcium carbonate. And what is relatively uh, new and what we've been hearing about with the Gibbs Hawaii and gotten so far this the uh, utilization part down here. And just to provide a, a sense of scale and Eugene commented uh, and showed some wonderful slides, historical data for Hawaii and so forth. So here we are for Oahu, the uh, per capita greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, yes, we are better than uh, the average for United States a bit more than the average uh, for the state. But relative to the global average, we are quite a bit higher. So uh, yes, the amount of direct emissions from the state are relatively small on a global scale. But when you look at it on a per person basis and so forth, um, we are considerably higher than the global average. And there is definitely a room for improvement. One thing uh, to point out, we're probably still going to be using fossil fuels by 2045, which is, you know, the date for 100% renewable electricity for the state. We still have CO2 emissions from other sources, the, mostly the uh, transportation, which we'll 
not be completely electrified, likely, by then. And the, this is from the city and county. They have their own programs to help reduce emissions and so forth. But nonetheless, uh, we're still going to, for the foreseeable future, be emitting the greenhouse gases. And some of this is uh, kind of beyond our control. And as Scott mentioned about jet fuel economy, essentially you can see that here with the big contributions from the air and then also the marine and our power production. To put the storage technologies in, in context here, so this slide, we've got the amount that can be stored is across the bottom, or rather, yeah, the amount and then the time and that it stays in storage is on the y-axis. So making the carbonates, all that wonderful geochemistry that is happening in Iceland and so forth, is really the type of technology that can take the most amount of the emissions and store it in a geological time scale. You, as was mentioned, uh, you don't have to worry about it. Once you've got a rock, it stays as a rock. It's not going to come percolating up into uh, the atmosphere again. There is currently a lot of storage being done with the fossil fuel industry. That's our enhanced oil recovery. So carbon dioxide is injected into the oil reservoirs to help increase the pressure, increase the yield. And the other ones that we talked about, we have the biomass. Uh, down here, the planting trees and agriculture and so forth. Uh, yes, does have significant potential. And the time frame there is what Scott was mentioning, the active cycle, talking in the neighborhood of uh, decades or a century or two. The other ones, personally, I find them a bit scary, uh, putting, essentially putting liquid CO2 into the deep ocean and letting it stay there. And over time, it will convert into the solids or the ocean neutral. You react the CO2 in the water first as a bicarbonate. The issue with that is really the impact on the marine life, um, which is, could be significant. Then to end on a happy note, uh, we do we have a problem, and this is our our data from the Big Island, well known CO two in the atmosphere, consistently increasing up and down with the seasons. And I think it's important takeaway from today's forum was to kind of reframe how you look at this and take a problem and consider it as an opportunity. So we, we heard from uh, CarbFix in Iceland, we've heard from, from Dibs Hawaii and so forth, and hoping uh, there will be other companies and entities that come into being to, to help create the economic opportunities and help reduce the, the problem and turn it in, into a solution. So that's my my quick uh, summary there. Thanks, Dr. Allen. And um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna hijack about two minutes of this discussion just to bring you up to speed. Um, that in the aviation world, they are making hydrogen powered aircraft. Um, Airbus has got three that they say will be out by 2035. Um, and several shipping, uh, shipbuilding companies and um, shipping companies are advertising that they're changing their commercial cargo vessels to electric power using either ammonia or hydrogen. So the, the, the idea of, um, you know, getting more efficient within the state at the, at the personal level, at the agricultural level and the industrial production level 
I'm, I'm happy to report that in the transportation sector, there still is work being done to decarbonize the transportation sector, including aviation and massive shipping. So it's looking up. I mean, we didn't want to be Mr. Gloom and Doom this whole time. Uh, and and there, there really is a lot of positive going on. And that's what I like to highlight here. Um, between the carbon issues that we talked about today, and even in the transportation sector, there's a lot of positive going on. So with that, I'll thank all of our presenters today for some outstanding work and turn it over to Michael to, to uh, wrap up the afternoon. Yeah, I, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Scott, for a great presentation. Thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you, Keone and, and, and uh, Scott. Um, tomorrow's another day and, and uh, Hawaii is a place where uh, even with, though we know we face challenges, we, we have the capacity to overcome them. So. Thank you all and uh, see you next time on Renew Rebuild Hawaii. Is there a chance that someone could address the, some of the questions in the comments that just came after these excellent last few presentations? Sure. Okay. Um, I'll, I have to get going, unfortunately, okay. so I won't be able to stick around, but I do want to just put a plug in for Debs that they are up for, I think, a uh, conference committee today on the legislature deciding on the special purpose revenue bonds that they've been applying for and we've been supporting them uh, to get. So Keone, I don't know if you've heard the latest, I haven't, but um, but I hope I hope the ledge does vote it out. Thank, thank you, Scott. Yeah, we're getting updates. I guess they uh, it's going to 5 p.m. So as we were speaking, they're actually in conference. Uh, it was just quite opportune, but I, we're just so excited to be a part of the solution and and uh, the networks that we're that we're sharing with these uh, interagencies, Hawaii State Energy Office, DHHL, uh, Department of Defense, the Navy, uh, Army National Guard, Air Guard. We're super grateful to be a part and a resident and a local small business trying to uh, provide solutions with the consortium. It is encouraging that there's the hundred. Uh, or $900 billion of grant funding from USDA available for carbon sequestration agrotech and also the special purpose revenue bonds in the legislature, I think is to the tune of about 40 million for this one. So one of the questions we were just wondering, uh, how does the cost possibly compare between the carb fix in Iceland, including the shipping costs to the islands um, as compared to using biomass for carbon capture, sequestration, and utilization. Anybody care to hit that one? Yeah, um, that's a good question, Chris. Um, as far as the numbers that Martin put out, you know, that, that's a large scale operation um, that they're doing, and you, you've seen their costs. and. And for me to, to answer your question on, on my scale and Keone's scale is for us as, uh, I forgot what Keone always uses, is, is like low, low tech, high innovation or something. Um, it, it's kind of like our model. So, you know, like one of the, the things that uh, Scott Glenn had said was, you know, using fossil fuel fertilizers. Our project here in Hawaii is all natural based. Um, we, we're not intending on using any uh, fertilizers or pesticides. We're looking at using what's on the farm. What can we use from green waste? Um, what is produced um, through the technologies that is being brought in? Um, and, and a lot of the technology that maybe Alika and Keone can talk on um, um, uh, isn't that much compared to what Iceland is doing because uh, we're working on the small scale. Um, and that $100 million uh, potential funding from the USDA, which, which I want to say with USDA coming out with that grant, it really validates the path that we've been on as far as sequestering carbon and creating uh, climate smart commodities for the underserved farmers. Uh, and with the SPURB coming out too, I think that's enough funding to help uh, get us going in Hawaii. So, so we're not at the level of Iceland as far as the expenditures and the big plants that they have were more small scale local Kanaka operations that can do uh, uh, good for, for our farms and, and our immediate communities.
I hope that answers kind of like your question. Mahalo Nui Scotty. And uh, maybe Keone, you could uh, talk to that too. But I, we were wondering also more in terms of the uh, cost per unit of the CCSU per ton of carbon, because that's the unit of cost that was being compared by Iceland. And that's what they trade with on the cap and trade markets is that unit of cost. So is there any uh, notion of the comparison of uh, cost per ton of carbon? Um, Chris, aloha. Thank you, Chris, again, for um, you've been so supportive of this uh, consortium and uh, reaching out to other island locations to, to do this work and have these discussions. Um, I, you know, Hawaii is in a space of a lot of learning right now um, where I, we have to actually touch, feel, experience and go through this stage right now um, where, you know, we will be recovering um, hundreds of tons of CO2. There's, there's hundreds of tons of CO2 emitted a day that we can take to, and I want to highlight food grade CO2. We want to recover it here in Hawaii and turn it to food grade CO2 so we can utilize agriculture, but at the same time, that food grade CO2 is also of high purity to be used for other utilize, uh, utilization. Um, so in regards to coming down to an exact cost uh, per ton of carbon, our cost of carbon dioxide should be, is, is relative like, to, to our cost of our imports. And so I, I think about import substitution and what that means by making things at home, we're offsetting a tremendous amount of carbon usage and that needs to be compounded. And that is something that we actually have not experienced. And this platform, uh, having an infrastructure to store and utilize CO2 to track gives us the data. We need to collect data now. That way we can see by going to import substitution models, actually how much carbon are we offsetting, thus putting a price point on their actual cost of carbon per ton here in the state of Hawaii. It shouldn't be representative to, let's say, North Dakota or Ohio or South Carolina, where everything is brought in on a container. Um, so it should be no different that we're using containers to move CO2 via virtual pipelines to support island chains. So we're, we're utilizing something that we use every single day as a benchmark to be able to distribute and do these climate smart uh, actions and, and uh, activities. So um, we need uh, we have a lot to learn. We have a lot to track and we're going to need the support of the university uh, DBED. Um, to be able to help track and get to a place where we can really create like the Kona coffee of carbon credits. I think Hawaii, Hawaii is in a unique position to really evaluate our, our own carbon footprint. And I think that's the best way I could answer that. Um, we've got a lot to learn and a lot of work ahead of ourselves and I'm excited to be, to be a part of it. Thanks Keone. There was a question about whether this is gonna be recorded and available later. And Stephen Allen answered that on the chat, but if you didn't catch it, um, this is being recorded, both audio and um, video, so it should be available on the Renew Rebuild Hawaii website in the not too distant future. And there's another question that Keone talked about. He's talked about bioacid, and that kind of confused a couple people. Yeah, um, that's because the the <laughs> his his reutilization improves the production of the um, algae that's used to make bioacid. So. So that, that's why it's important. He's, he's saying just one of the crops that, that they use it for is an algae crop, which is not your traditional agriculture that we think about, but it, it's something that's an important export for Hawaii. We export bioacid. It's popular worldwide. And this is another thing, you know, with, with Eugene and, and Scott both being part of DBED, um, you know, we're talking about Hawaii's economy. We're talking about doing the best we can to support our own economy uh, without making more pollution, without increasing a carbon footprint, um, being more efficient with what we've got, being more productive with what we have and not polluting. And I think that the, the folks on this panel have brought to light some things that we, we need to think about. Um, and maybe we need to cooperate more on to um, take operations like Honua Ola and say, Hey, if you did this and you did this and you did this, you, you might be doing us a favor. But right now, a lot of people think you're you're actually not doing us a favor. So let's work together and and come up with solutions in a more synergistic way. And I, I think we'd really come out way ahead. And if any place can do it, it'll be here because Hawaii has a history and a culture 
of doing uh, the right thing and being sustainable and cooperating to get it done. Stanley, real quick, I just wanted to add, because you, uh, they talked about BIOS and algae. One of the things that Ohanihui Ventures is doing with uh, New Island Solutions uh, that was brought up was that algae or like even duckweed um, is, is, is one of the, the best uh, forms to create biofuels. Um, although we're focused on uh, industrial hemp right now as our phase one, uh, we really want to start looking at algae and duckweed um, as, as forms of uh, uh, generating fuels. All right, back and, to you, uh, Stanley, Stanley, oh. really quick, thanks for your comment on history and culture. Uh, we're in a historic time because not only are there these uh, funding unprecedented from the USDA, you know, to the amount of $900 million in a grant pool, um, where for the first time it's targeting small underserved farmers and farms that are utilizing carbon sequestration technology in, in their agribusiness and agriculture. And so it's a really great opportunity for the first time because as you probably know, USDA grants in the past have focused on large scale agri, you know, agribusinesses had an advantage to apply for those grants. And then on the macro policy level, just recently you all probably heard that uh, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, a lot of fellow island uh, states. Uh, they were supposed to have a summit at the White House, but only Singapore made it. They postponed the other nations for uh, a bit later, but the Singapore Prime Minister came and the joint communique from the President and the Prime Minister of Singapore highlighted um, as an agreement, an MOA, that they're going to work on partnerships for exactly that of Carbon, carbon capture, sequestration, and utilization technologies in agriculture and the economy and commerce in general. So it's become a top of the nation policy. Therefore, uh, federal departments like agriculture will take that into account as they're putting, you know, making their decisions on where to allocate this kind of funding for grants and in this case to small farms and small agri-tech businesses. So it's extraordinary. I, I think it's great that the federal government's doing that. And if they could reduce the amount of paperwork it requires to keep uh, keep track of all that money, um, it'd be even more helpful because I think more people would apply. There's actually been surplus money in HUD and Department of Agriculture for a lot of years where Hawaii was underrepresented in getting those grants. And a lot of that has to do with just the bureaucracy that goes with it. So I agree. I, I take uh, all the help anybody can give us uh, at the state level or the federal level, but it would sure help to kind of cut through some of the red tape and make it easier for small farmers to uh, be able to apply for those grants. Yeah, and the agreement with Singapore, which is roughly the size of Oahu, um, and they're on the cutting edge of, of uh, carbon carbon capture, sequestration, and utilization, as well as in agritech. Um, it bodes really well for partnerships and synergy throughout the Asia Pacific region, which is our neighborhood, that we can really get some synergy with these fellow uh, Pacific, Asia Pacific island nations. Agreed. Like New Zealand and so forth, Fiji are doing things. Well, I, I work a lot in the energy realm and I'm, I'm constantly amazed at the networking that is done worldwide, especially from Hawaii out to other reaches. Geothermal, we talked about Iceland. We didn't talk about New Zealand, but Hawaii shares a lot with New Zealand culturally yes. and technologically and scale and everything else. It's, it's really amazing. Even today's forum brought that out. So I want to hand it back over to Michael because we I think we've maxed out on our time here and get it back to uh, the guy who really owns this program, Michael Markrich for Renew Rebuild Hawaii. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I want to I wanna thank you all again. You know, one of the interesting things about Iceland is that you had a power company that doesn't just sell power, it sells ideas, it sells ideas all over the world. And, you know, we have here uh, Tom Quinn, who's from eFuel, who's one of the most interesting entrepreneurs who's, who's taking agriculture and creating new kinds of power generating system from agricultural waste. So maybe that's a program we can have in the future. 
Um, I, you know, I want to I thank you all for your interest, your excitement, and your willingness to try new things. So until the next time on Renew Rebuild Hawaii, uh, thank you very much and aloha. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Aloha. Mahalo. Aloha. Mahalo. Mahalo.